These are some of the greatest gardens in Britain. From a ducal castle to a garden once lost in time. From a modern masterpiece to a plantsman's paradise. We've searched out the finest in the land. Each has its own unique story to tell. It's delightful. Join me, Carol Klein, on a journey through the four seasons Woo! as I experience a year in their lives. Meet the people who look after them. This is the season which seems to be attached to my soul. This is my midlife crisis bit, really. <laughs> Glimpse what goes on behind the scenes. Come on, share your secrets. Reflect on their magnificent designs and celebrate the plants that make each so special. As I look through these massive pinnacles of flower, I can see the pinnacles themselves. Serendipity! From up and down the land, these are great British gardens, waiting to be discovered. I'm really looking forward to it. Bet you are too. This is Woolerton Old Hall Garden. Set around a 16th century house, it's a beautiful and intricate four-acre oasis in the English garden tradition, with echoes of the Edwardian arts and crafts style. With its traditional craftsmanship, sympathetic architecture, elegant topiary and hedges and deep borders, it looks like it's been here for a hundred years. And yet, it may come as quite a surprise to learn that this magnificent garden was created from scratch by its owners, Leslie and John Jenkins, in just 36 years. After first living in Woolerton Old Hall as a child, Leslie was so besotted with the house and the land around it, she came back and bought the property in 1983. Since then, Leslie and John have set about recapturing the spirit and quality of a bygone era, but with fabulous drifts of modern planting. And I think there's no better time of year to appreciate Woolerton's mellow, restful atmosphere than during autumn. Laid out as a series of linked garden rooms, Woolerton is full of unexpected corners and vistas that change dramatically with the seasons. Even in autumn, there are bold bursts of colour, especially here in the Sundial Garden, which is overflowing with asters. You come into these borders and you just know it's autumn. We all know them as Michaelmas daisies, and you don't see them at any other time of year. They actually depend on shortening day length and lowering temperatures to produce their flowers for the flowers to open. These asters actually take their names from the Latin names of places on the eastern seaboard of the United States, including New England, Novi Angliae. I love these asters. They're always tall and very, very visible almost always in vivid wine sort of colours, clarets and purples. But the thing is, they establish the season. They let you know that autumn's well and truly here. Woolerton Hall dates from the Elizabethan era, with a timber-framed house making a perfect backdrop for the beautiful garden. Leslie and John have created 16 garden rooms cleverly defined by walls, hedges, topiary and paths that positively effervesce with an abundance of modern planting. There's a structured formality of the old garden and the lime alley, dissected by the crisp lines of the lower rill. Next door to that, the upper rill reflects a stately parade of box domes. To the right of the house is a peaceful shade garden, 
its muted colours another haven of tranquillity. But further down from the house, Leslie's theatrical personality takes centre stage with a dramatic explosion of colour all year round in the Lanhydrock Garden. And that's where I'm meeting Leslie today, at the beginning of my year-long journey. I love the, <laughs> the way you come through hedges and that, woo! This is the heart and soul of the garden here, Carol. It's lovely. This is my midlife crisis bit, really, <laughs> when I wanted to uh, go for it, you know? So it's full of vivid colours and big foliage and... The whole thing bounces around, doesn't it? Yes, yes. Other parts of the garden, some of them are calm, but this one, I want it to explode when you walk through. There's this marvellous rhythm through everything. That's very deliberate, isn't it? Very much so, yes. I was looking at sort of form as well as colour yeah. and texture. You know, it's magic making a garden. Yes, but this bed in particular is beautiful, it's perfect. I worked very hard on this corner. I wanted the grass to be on the corner to look through at the muted colours. Yeah. And then when you go around the other part of it, of course, the colours, wow, in zing. Your face. Yes. zing in your face. Yes. This is a, a Melinia. It is, yeah. Heather Bride. It's one yeah. I don't yeah. really know, but it's just right for that purpose. But don't you think it takes years to do a border? You can't just plan it on paper and it works like that. I don't think it does. No, not at all. But isn't that one of the joys of the way you garden anyway? It that is you joy. are constantly changing and experimenting. And I love these big structures. They're very useful, aren't they? Give a bit of height to the garden mm -hmm. and also an excuse to grow something up there. <laughs> if you needed any excuse to put plants in. But this, this is something else, actually. Could you get a more brilliant yellow than that? It's a Rebecca, isn't it? It is. Rebecca yep. Fulgida, I think. Yes. But in your garden, it's the plants you notice, but it's the structure that holds everything together. Was it always like this? No, not in a million years. There was nothing here at all when we returned to the house. Nothing at all? No, it's a field, really. Right. The, the cattle grazing in it. So we did island beds, and then we realised that it just looked wrong for the house and the ethos of the place yeah. totally wrong i have to evolve it's like painting yeah you know but the difficulty is you can scrape oil can't you off a canvas yeah once you've planted you've got to wait to see what happens the fearless broad brush strokes of her planting style keep leslie's garden vibrant all year round but her quest to produce picture perfect landscapes means she needs a team around her who share her attention to detail. Stripping the bark? It's the most therapeutic job. Can I join in? You can indeed. And I'm looking forward to meeting head gardener Phil as he gives nature a helping hand with some beautiful Himalayan birch trees. <laughs> I've come to Woolerton Old Hall Garden in Shropshire, home to artist Leslie Jenkins and her husband John. Their four-acre arts and crafts inspired garden is a visual delight, with surprising bursts of colour everywhere, even in the depths of autumn. Leslie's a passionate plantswoman, but her garden is so richly planted it would be hard to maintain alone. So she relies on head gardener Phil Smith to keep it in order throughout the seasons. You're stripping the bark. Hello, Carol. Hiya. I know, it's the most therapeutic job. Can I join in? You can indeed. Now, this is Betula Jack Montia, isn't it? Yeah, they naturally start to peel, and this time of year we come along and tidy them up ready for the, for the winter, and it reveals that new layer of fresh bark. So I just use lukewarm water and yeah. uh, a dustpan brush, and you just start at the top and work your way down, and that cleans off all this green, um, green marking that has uh, occurred during the summer. So how long have you been here, Phil? Uh, just a few years. I started nearly four years ago, and I applied to come to Woolerton because I really like the garden. I adore garden design, so to get the opportunity to come and work here, absolutely amazing. Sounds like serendipity. Completely. I would love to have worked in a garden like this. Am I doing this right? Does it yep. matter? There is no special technique to this whatsoever. After you've done a small bit, you can uh, get a cloth and uh, just start to wipe it off. 
and it starts to bring up uh, the nice white colour. They're one of my favourite trees we have in the garden here. I mean, they stand out beautifully now, but um, in the winter it must be even more so. Yes. You should wait until the end of the winter going into the spring, and this is a sea of white snowdrops, and these white trees absolutely glisten as they poke up through that white carpet. Mm. And against the nice dark yew hedge, they really do sparkle and shine. So uh, I can imagine it now. I really Just can. wait and see. Yeah. You can really see the difference, can't you? In the meantime, there's still so much to see here. Everywhere you turn, there's a tantalising glimpse through a hedge or a dramatic gateway that open onto other beautifully designed spaces. It's pure theatre. To achieve this level of stage management, Leslie relies on the gardening team, a group of volunteers and the support of husband John. <laughs> Are you meddling with your meddler? No, I'm meddling with <laughs> my <I'm> meddler, yeah. <laughs> It's the most glorious tree, but yeah. it's all on its own, John. We realised that when we put these big box domes in, the whole thing was out of balance, and we thought we need a tree here. So, we got a meddler. Meddlers were at the peak of their popularity in the 1600s, when Woolerton Hall was built. So they would have been very familiar to whoever lived here then. Of course, the meddler, has beautiful white flowers about that big. Which we'll see, won't we? You will, indeed. Yeah. But, of course, people are not interested in that. They're interested in these fruit. And they've got quite a few funny names. They have, they? indeed. <laughs> the French have got the funniest yeah. because they think that the top of the fruit looks like the rear end of a dog's anatomy. Yes. <laughs> but they're edible. But there are all sorts of strange processes you've got oh, to go well. through, aren't there? Well, the Elizabethans loved them, and people say it's either an incredible subtle taste or you can't taste anything. Oh, right. But the most important thing is you cannot pick it now. We've got to wait until it's bletted. Right. Bletted means rotten. Once the fruit has bletted, it can be made into a jelly. Do you want me to try for our next visit? Oh, what? Yeah. Yes. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Yes, it would, and you yeah. can all eat it. Oh, I would love that. Oh, Absolutely right. I adore that. Well, I was going to throw them away, but I won't <laughs> now. I'll pick them very, very carefully. Uh, it's something to look forward to, isn't it, Carol? It really is. Yeah. yeah. I love these domes. They're smashing. Each one took five men to lower it in on a tarpaulin in, into the really? hole. And then having put it in the hole, she said, oh, that, that one needs to come over here. <laughs> So we get the five men back again. <laughs> <laughs> and move it a few inches yeah. to the left. Yeah. In this quiet corner is the well garden, where I've been drawn by something else you don't always get in mid-October, the promise of this late rose, Lady Emma Hamilton. Oh, it's the most Exquisite perfume exuding from this rose. It's almost fruity, it's summery, really. Here, Leslie has this capacity. It's almost an intuition, not just to choose the right plant for the right place, but also to ensure that the pictures she creates carry you through from summer into autumn and beyond. Woolerton's still so full of scent and colour. It's hard to believe a change of season is just around the corner. But the nights are drawing in and it's time for the garden to change its coat for winter. Optimistic gardeners say there's no such thing as bad weather, only different kinds of good weather. And although it's been one of the warmest and wettest winters on record, the solid design and beautiful structure of Woolerton really comes into its own at this time of year. And it's now in the midst of winter. 
that you can see the garden in all its stark simplicity. What a difference from the autumn abundance that was everywhere when we last saw the garden. Leslie and her team have stripped everything back to its bare bones. With just the skeleton of the garden on show, I'm reminded how Leslie's complex artistic vision has breathed life into what was once an empty field. Even now, there's drama on a grand scale around every corner. I just love the way your garden's all about sort of entrances and exits. It's very Shakespearean, it's very theatrical. It's funny you should say that, but I love theatre design. That's what I always wanted to do, really. And that's what you've done. You've created theatre within it, too. When you look at things like these lovely yews, are they obelisks? I think they are obelisks, yeah. yes. Well, they are now, but when they went in, they must have been teeny. They were. They were little feathers, really. Yeah. And yet you still got in your mind's eye mm -hmm. what mm. you wanted to achieve with mm. them. Mm. I mean, that's real vision, mostly, but, and it's what you need, especially with a garden on this sort of scale. What do you do when they get too big? Call in Andy and Anya. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are they the ones who are in charge of all the yes. time? Yes, yes, they are. And if you don't have room for dramatic youth spires, there are exciting planting ideas on a completely different scale in the woodland garden. Oh, look, this is another world, isn't it? It's magical. The light's lovely today, isn't it? Oh, it's absolutely perfect. Gorgeous. Did you order yeah. it especially? I think so, <laughs> yes, I did. But it's coming through on those snowdrops there. They look like little icicles, don't they? They do. Now, these halibos, I love the way you've planted them because sometimes you see them in a very random kind of way. Well, what we do is, when the seedlings, because they produce so many thousands of seedlings, yeah. don't they? So we, we take those up, we pot some up, and if they're good, we keep them, obviously. I mean, sometimes people are trying to breed these halibos at face upwards, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think that misses the point, because isn't mm -hmm. half the fun just turning them over? Yes. And seeing what's seeing, inside. Yes, the beauty of them. It's like a watercolour, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But it's the wet, isn't it, this winter that's been predominant? Oh, dreadful. You couldn't get on the soil at all. No. And we've, uh, what we've done is we've mulched with our own compost, leaf mould. Yeah. We take it all off, obviously, and compost it, and then last seasons. And then so it's completely covered in leaf mould, which has helped a bit. So you need to take all your leaves away, uh, let them turn into leaf mould, and then bring, bring them, them back. Bring them back, yes. Yeah. Leaf mould adds structure and organic matter to your soil and it's so easy to do. You can use wire mesh and wooden stakes to make a bin and pile in your fallen leaves. Then just sprinkle it with water and leave it for a year or two till the leaves crumble. In the depths of winter, when the choice of plants is pared back to the bone, it's the subtlest things that catch the eye or the nose. It's delightful. This has to be one of the best treats of winter. It's Lonicera purpusei. It's a winter flowering honeysuckle. And this selection's called Winter Beauty. And it truly is beautiful. I mean, the flowers themselves are delicate. In this case, it's kept most of its leaves. Sometimes it loses them. And in this winter cold and this bleak, bleak season, to smell something like this, just, it's just beautiful. It's at this time of year that you can truly appreciate the exquisite design and craftsmanship of Woolerton structural details. It's an ethos that was central to the arts and crafts movement. One of my favourite spots is the pleached lime alley. I mustn't surprise you. Hello, Carol. <laughs> Don't want you falling off your ladder. I'll come down. I'm not going to ask you what you're doing because it's pretty obvious from what you've already done. Yeah, Absolutely we're um, beautiful. pleaching the lime trees. Yeah. So it's uh, one of my favourite jobs to do in the garden. Yes. 
and has to be done in the at this time of year. Yep, when they're dormant in the winter and we're pruning off all of the previous season's growth back to the bare stems. So what's uh, it called? This is Tilia platyphylos uh, rubrus. It's a really common variety that you'll see certainly throughout yeah. Europe as well being used for this purpose. And even though it looks lovely with this nice ruddy red colour, they look equally good, I think, when they've actually been pleached and you take all that growth off to reveal this really architectural form that certainly on a day like today with the sun out, cast these beautiful shadows. Very I think dramatic, aren't they, when they're done? Would you like to get up the ladder? Yeah, with that. Right up to the top, all the way. Let's have a go. Can I start on this one? You can indeed, and just nice and tight, back to that knuckle arrangement. Oh, they're lovely and sharp. It's got to be clean though, hasn't it? Because you, you don't want to leave any snags and that invites disease, doesn't it? It does. I wonder how many stems you actually cut. Thousands. <laughs> I tried to count them once and I gave up. <laughs> There's way too many. I'm not surprised. I like this. It's very therapeutic. I really could stay up here for a long time, but I don't want to deprive you. <laughs> Job you obviously yeah. love so much. Oh, I did enjoy that. Thanks very much. It's the first time I've ever pleached a lime. G'day. It was wonderful. I've left you a few. Thank you very much. <laughs> See you later. Beach and home beam can also be trained. As can apples and pears. But right now, I'm off to find out whether John delivered on the promise he made me in the autumn to make a jelly from the fruits of the medlar tree. What a treat! <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you think so. So I'm dying to taste it. Right. After being boiled with water and sugar, the jelly was strained and put into jars. And now that he's a leading expert on this Elizabethan delicacy, John's brought us a Shropshire blue cheese to try it with. ta -da! Very Ooh. crumbly cheese. Lovely and crumbly. <laughs> How gorgeous. Are you dolloping it on the top? I'm, I'm going to eat it separately. That. Are you? Yeah. One, two, three. It's lovely. It's very difficult to describe. It is, isn't it? Well, it's, it is appley, but... It's very fruity. It's really fruity. It could do with less sugar, I think. Anyway, it's utterly delicious. You never know. In the garden tea room, people will be clamouring for this. They will indeed if I haven't eaten it all first. Oh. Whether or not you decide to have a go at making medley jelly, this is a lovely compact tree for a small garden. And as winter draws to a close, I can't wait to see what other inspiration is waiting in the wings. The winter storms and rainfall that have battered the country are over. And with the lighter days of spring, lush shades of green and much longed for colour are surging in the garden. The trees are performing their yearly trick of looking new again. And thousands of bulbs planted months ago are jostling for position in every border. It's one of Leslie's favourite times of year. It's a bit of a cliché, what I feel about spring, but it's the beginning. You've had winter to plan and design, and then all of a sudden you can get out there and you can actually do things. And it, it is a wonderful feeling. Leslie's mad about tulips, and pots crammed with a mouth-watering variety splash a rainbow across the front of the house. I just adore them. I love the water lilies, the pom-poms, all sorts of colours. The long borders, which are such a feature of arts and crafts gardens, are beginning to soften the hard edges of Woolerton's bones with their natural drifts of colourful planting. With 16 individual gardens, each with its own character, 
It's a busy time for head gardener Phil. I like spring. Spring's brilliant, especially April going into May. And I think it's because of the choice of greens that come up. They're really fresh and vibrant. This is the spring bowl border, um, which we created about three years ago. Leslie calls it her tapestry Persian carpet. So it's a real kaleidoscope of colours. We've got everything in here. We're weaving plants together, the tulips, throw caution to the winds with the colours. We don't particularly plan the colours. They just go in, cheers you up. It might be snowing even, but it doesn't matter. It's just this popping up of the beautiful plants in there. Every tree, shrub and flower has been carefully chosen and positioned to play its part in the series of artistic compositions that make up Leslie and John's garden. In the shade garden, snowdrops and hellebores that look so fresh and delicate here in the winter have given way to a host of colourful spring woodland perennials got lots of erythroniums and we've got trilliums. We've got other plants starting to come through. So we've got pulmonarias and dicentra. And that colour continues all the way through into early summer. Leslie knows just how to highlight and set off the different shades of green with a paler flower or a shrub that will catch your eye. Like this Pittisporum Irene Patterson. When the foliage is new, it's very pale green, almost white. And then, as it matures, the green within the leaf gets darker and the pale parts get lighter, creating a lovely marbled effect. At this time of year, it's smothered in lots of tiny, chocolate burgundy flowers, so discreet you almost miss them. But it's the foliage that's so distinctive. And if you're into flower arranging, it's a perfect evergreen shrub for your garden. One of the most joyful corners of the garden is a small space tucked away behind the stately grandeur of the pleached lime alley. Alice's garden is one of Leslie's favourite places to sit and enjoy all the best things about spring. It's a cottage garden, really, and lots of little things in it. Primroses, got to be one of my favourites. Primrose, beautiful little things. And then, of course, we've got the little water feature, and that's lovely with the blue tits. All the birds are making nests and diving in there and off. It's all busy in there. And sitting here brings back fond memories for Leslie. We named Alice's garden after a very favourite ugly little cat. She was the runt of the litter, but she was very sweet. And she got something wrong with her voice. She sort of croaked when she meowed, and she always slept there. While the wildlife is flourishing, there are plenty of spring jobs for the team to be getting on with. So these are all hazel, uh, hazel twigs that we've uh, cut from the garden and they're perfect for staking at this time of year. So all of the perennials are starting to grow up really quite quickly. So this is Veronicastrum pointed finger and uh, it has lovely pink flower spikes uh, in early summer but you can see how quick it's growing and we need to give it some support. So these bits of um, twig will just provide the support it needs. And when I've uh, put them in, all I'm gonna do is just snap them and bend them over the actual clump. And what will happen are the shoots will start to grow up through the uh, bent over twigs and it will just give it the support it needs. You can buy twigs and they're very expensive. So if you know someone with a woodland or you've got a bit of room in your garden for some hazel at home, it's the perfect thing to grow. And then you can uh, coppice it each year. You can use the longer stems for growing maybe runner beans up and uh, the shorter ones for doing this. And of course, all this is really natural looking. So. Uh, there's no wire, no string, and it will just uh, blend in with the plant as it grows up. I love the idea of using hazel to keep this Veronicastrum growing straight and true, and yet still looking as though it's unsupported. 
It's just one of many clever tricks Phil uses to help make this garden look effortlessly beautiful. As the days lengthen, there will be many visitors like me looking forward to the promise of summer. It's summer at Woolerton Old Hall. Days stretch into each other. There's vivid colour and the smell of mown grass. Everywhere, scents hang in the air. With the sun on full beam, every dazzling aspect of the garden is illuminated in all its elegant beauty. And the Lan Hydrock Garden, where I first met Leslie in the autumn, is now a blaze of colour. This has to be one of the most exciting, the most vibrant parts of the garden. And though it's fairly big and quite open, nonetheless, you get this feeling of intimacy as you walk around it. It's all about you and the plants. Look at this Ostrom area. It's positively sizzling, it's on fire. And then you move into these red salvias. Leslie combines colours and she uses all, lots of tricks and devices to make all these oranges and reds really glow. She puts in plants with brilliant blue flowers just here and there arranged amongst them. They're the opposite end of the colour spectrum and that makes the reds and oranges even more so. It's a really clever technique and one that all of us could use in our own gardens. You just don't know where to look first. When you come across this great big Achillea, you think it's just for your benefit. You know, it's all about this moment. These beautiful flat plates of gold. When we were here back in the autumn, it was all about texture. It was all about that mellowing of color and things undulating, all about form. But now, it's all about colour. The whole place sizzles. The whole garden is just on fire. As well as using the full palette of summer colours at her disposal, Leslie creates adventurous plant combinations to paint her beautiful pictures. There's no more luscious example of an English summer border than this glorious mix of perennials and roses composed by Leslie and John in the Sundial Garden. I was just completely overcome when I came into the garden. I, I truly was. It is so beautiful. Thank you very much, Carol. Nobody coming in here would think there was any competition between the roses and the perennials at all because everything just melts together so beautifully. Well, personally, I don't like to see a lot of bare soil unless it's immaculately gardened. Well, it's a waste of space, isn't it? Well, it is, yes. And also, it's important, I think, to not only have the low things in the garden, like the stack is there, but to have spikes. Yeah. Verticals. That's so important. Which groups of plants do you find go best with these kind of roses? Well, they are the plants that will not overpower the roses and give the roses plenty of room. So they're not sprawlers. So we can take geraniums, we can take paniculata phloxes, we can take salvias, and we can take dahlias, which are basically all very well behaved plants. They are. And how often do you prune these roses? Because this is a moot point, isn't it? Whether or not you, you, know, you do prune shrub roses. We deadhead a lot. Yes. I mean, even this evening, come hail, rain or snow, hopefully not. We hopefully will be, not. Yeah. <laughs> we will be deadheading. Yeah. Because that's so important, isn't it? Because that just promotes further yeah. flower production. Yeah. 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 While the borders are allowed to flourish, the topiary needs keeping under strict control. And later, I find out how it's done. I've had no formal training. I'm just very fussy, I'm OCD.
has arrived in a blaze of glory at Woolerton Old Hall, with so many shrubs and perennials packing the borders. Phil's got his work cut out to keep everything looking perfect for the garden's many visitors. What are you up to, Phil? I'm disbudding the dahlias to get better flowers. Yeah? It's um, a grower's technique, really, to try and get nice tall stems, really good, strong flowers. Um, and it's really simple to do. So you'll see that the, uh, the dahlia stem comes up with the flower bud, the primary bud at the top, yeah. and then it will have secondary and third buds coming up. And all we want to do is literally just snap those off. Right. And they detach really nicely. Just and like tomatoes when you take exactly it Exactly the same, yeah. taking the side shoots off. And what that means is the energy now is back into that one right. single flower stem so it will get a good flower. So otherwise all our energy goes into lots of flower production, but they're all on the small side. Yeah. And a bit floppy too. All floppy, all on the floor, and especially if you get wind or rain, uh, you've kind of had it with your displays. Right. This dahlia in particular, absolutely gorgeous. So this is Charlie Dimmock. How'd you do, Charlie? <laughs> She's yeah. really lovely, isn't she? <laughs> She's uh, gorgeous. Really good water lily type dahlia. Right, can I have a go? You can. Yeah. There's a few down the front. Yeah, now do you actually leave these leaves in, yeah. in situ? Yep, leave them in. You right. will just be able to snap the stems off. And the younger you do it, the easier it is. So as soon as the buds are forming, you can start to take them away. And you also don't get any wound marks either. Just snip it off. Yep, just snip there. it off cleanly right. um, and it will keep going. There can be something really satisfying about producing a single show-off flower. But sometimes Mother Nature is best left to do the job all by herself. This little rill garden with its central pond is one of the most iconic features here at Wollaton. It's lovely. As soon as you look at this central piece of water here, you're immediately drawn to these beautiful iris, arranged one in each corner. A very simple but a very, very effective arrangement. This is Iris and Sarta, Rose Queen. It's a complete delight. It's a member of the butterfly iris clan. They come from Japan originally. Now, Iris Hensata is very, very happy, as you can see, with its feet in the water. It loves paddling. But equally well, you can grow it in any sort of damp border. It mixes beautifully well with other plants. One of my favourite features at Woolerton is the astonishing topiary, especially the box puddings. Here, it's kept in perfect shape by husband and wife team Andy and Anya. Topiary in the hedges and everything are such an important part of this garden, aren't they? They are. I mean, so who does what? I do the topiary shapes, the balls, and mainly the pyramids, though I do yeah. have a bit of help. On the big pyramids, we both have to do it. Somebody yeah. has to stand at a distance and go left a bit, right a bit. I mean, that's like a sculptor or... A... You know, doing a painting, yeah. isn't it? You need to stand back and look yeah. at what you've done. They are marvellous. How on earth do you get them so symmetrical? Well, we have what you call a batter gauge, and that's an implement <laughs> made out of wood, and we have it set at a certain angle. You hold it against? Yes. Yeah. And that the ensures straight, yeah. that not just each side is the same, but if you've got several of them in a row, they all fit in with each other. They're all identical. That's yeah. brilliant. So when you come in to do something like this... So I set a height. Yeah. And I follow the same height all the way down and I set, I set a width. So it's really important to keep the shears as flat as you can when you've got that height set. It must kill your back though, Anya. It does. Topiary is an art with a history. It was a common sight in formal Tudor gardens, so the many edges, hedges, box balls and obelisks are very much in keeping here. What do you enjoy most? Do you enjoy all those big hedges and hedge trimming? I do, yeah. I like doing the hedges. You're good at all the straight lines, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. And I like the balls. Yeah. <laughs> I you just do. seem to be able to follow the sphere. I've had no formal training. I'm just... Very fussy, OCD. So this is the perfect occupation if you're OCD, isn't yes. it? Because it has to be spot on. Yeah. This obviously works. Yeah. You've only to look at the results. While Woolerton's crisp hedges and borders of roses, irises and delphiniums 
point to its traditional English garden roots. Leslie's definitely not one to be defined by the past. She's never afraid to try something new, and in the long walk, she's going for a very contemporary look. Leslie, you're constantly moving this garden forward, and this bit's only been designed for a few years, hasn't it? Yeah, this is a new bit here, and um, what I'm trying to do, basically, is dumb some of the planting down and concentrate on quite a few colours. Yeah. So which colours? I can see lots of silver and darkness, too. Yeah, you're right. It's the silver. Silver to put a little full stop every so often, yeah. you know, with the cardoons yeah. and the esteem. Yeah, this rather large esteem. It is rather large, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it really makes an impact, doesn't yes. it? Yeah. So which plants have you used for your dark areas? They're dark and dangerous, aren't they? Well, yeah, the Romantica, Clematis Romantica, yeah. which is... Oh, wow. Beautiful, isn't it? Oh, one of my favourites. These lovely Acteas are just oh, they're splendid, they're aren't gorgeous, they? gorgeous, aren't they? Uh, James Compton, yeah. one, and then Brunette. That's Brunette over there. Right. Yes. So very, very dark foliage. Yes. Do you find that very challenging, or is that the sort of major part of what you do, this evolving, you know, this idea that the garden's never still, never going to stay like it is? No, that's a good bit. I can't bear to see a garden that never changes, particularly my own. OK, the structure may stay the same, but having said that, I've, I've still got ideas. You've just got to go on, haven't you? It's, that's what it's all about. It is. As gardening, as with life. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> this is a garden for all seasons, with the fine bones of its winter structure as compelling as the full flush of summer colour. And it's the eye of a true artist that brings it all together through this incredible series of gardens within a garden. It's difficult to believe that this garden has been created during just one lifetime. But that is Leslie's genius. She combines modern sensibilities with this old English garden tradition. And John and Leslie are constantly looking forward, always playing with every element here striving to create the most beautiful pictures and effects. And that's why Woolerton is truly a great British garden. <laughs>